Hello everyone and welcome to the Fusion EP Talks. This is the talk number 25 of our student-led webinar series. Today, our uh, speaker is Mr. Vignesh Gopakumar. He is the alumnus of the Fusion EP Master's program, which was previously funded by the ESCEA. And it has also uh, managed to renew the funding. So he's from that program. He currently works at the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Association Center, uh, Kalham Center for Fusion Energy. And his post there is of the, of the Chief Scientific Machine Learning Engineer. Um, uh, we will have his talk. And after the talk, we will have a question answer round where you can raise your hands. And if you cannot raise your hands due to some Zoom technical errors, you can write your questions uh, to the per as a personal message to us. Uh, with this, uh, and yes, we will be recording the video and it will be available on YouTube afterwards for those who have missed out on the talk. But without further ado, I give it to Vignesh. Hi, uh, great to be here guys. Thank you so much for this opportunity. So as Dawal just previously mentioned, I'm the chief scientific machine learning engineer. Uh, scientific machine learning is something that's relatively new and it's being treated with a lot of excitement at this uh, moment. And at Kalum itself, we are building a vast team, mainly of very eager young students from universities all across the world who are coming in and helping contribute, build Python pipelines to analyze the data in modern scientific machine learning methods, as well as build uh, more um, surrogate tools that can effectively help, in, uh, help accelerate our traditional approaches to uh, fusion programming. Right, so here in this talk, I will be mentioning about uh, Sorry, can I just share the screen? Right. In this talk, our entire focus is going to be about creating neural network-based surrogate modeling. One of the main issues that we face in fusion simulations and plasma simulations is there are various amounts of bottleneck in, in effectively simulating the core and the edge at the same time. And uh, in order to have real-time integrated solvers, we need to sort of address this. So the idea of surrogate models have been floating around for a while. Uh, and with the advent of neural networks and the fast, efficient data processing that they offer, we started exploring utilizing these neural networks to build uh, machine, to, to build uh, surrogate models that can effectively solve the physics at a much, much faster pace. So just to give this, just to give you an overlay of the stock, this is just an introduction into the approaches that we take in building a, uh, uh, surrogate model for physics simulations. We'll be looking at different kinds of surrogate models that we can derive from this. Uh, the entire talk involves only focusing on neural network based regressions. So how do we predict complex nonlinear, uh, the evolution of complex nonlinear phenomena using neural networks? So having talked about neural network for all, I think let's just jump into what a neural network is. If we were to take it as a black box, which is as often it's touted in every literature you find, it is just a utility that transforms a set of inputs to another set of outputs. And how the, how the transformation works is through multiplication with sets of matrices and applying nonlinear functions on top of these matrix products. So in order to give you a good overview of how we use neural networks to solve PDEs, I think it's very important that we understand a basic structure of how a neural network works. So I'm gonna just lay out a very basic network. This is what we call a multi-layer perceptron. It's a very simple network where we have the input layer, where we feed in two inputs, X1 and X2. The input layer transforms into two activations, H1 and H2 in the hidden layer, which undergoes another set of transformation to form Y tilde at the output layer. So effectively, this does a set of matrix transformations from X1, X2 to Y. And all we're interested in is effectively predicting 
the output as close to the real as possible. So how does, how does the network do these transformations? It is performed by a set of weights and biases. So each, sorry, each activation such as H1 here is the weighted sum of the inputs from the previous layer. So effectively it's each neuron, as we call one of the activations is connected to all the neurons in the previous layer. And as the information flows through, it is multiplied by a weight and then you add a bias to add more flexibility to the linear model you build up. But now so far it's only linear, but in order to account for the nonlinear behavior in the model that we're trying to predict, we need to apply an activation function. So once I get to the equations that show how H1, H2 and Y tilde forms, it's a bit more clear. Effectively, what it does is it takes the weighted sum of its previous, of, of all the nodes in the previous layer, creates a straight line and then distorts that straight line by a nonlinear activation function. So the nonlinear activation function is what it gives the, the, this sense of being able to replicate different nonlinearities. It could be any, it could be any nonlinear function, but for the usage of training, we effectively go for a nonlinear function that is easily differentiable. One for which we know the differential solution uh, at any point in our input, input space, sorry. Right, so having progressed through our output, uh, I'm sorry, can I just cross check if everyone can see the, sl the slide? So having understood, sorry, ha having had the inputs being fed into the network to give a particular output, in our neural network training process, we rely on something called supervised learning, where we know the inputs and how the output should be, but we just don't know how to map from the inputs to the outputs. So we characterize this level of deviation from the actual ground truth as the loss function, which could be a mean absolute error between uh, the neural network predicted output and the original output or the mean square error. Or there's various other different factors, values that we could take in, but something that gives a numerical value to how deviant the neural network output is from the actual solution. So what facilitates the neural network output is inputs being processed by these weights and biases. So if we were to put different number for values for these weights and biases, the output would be different for the same X1 and X2. So if the objective is to minimize the loss, to ensure that our prediction model is as close to the ground truth as possible, what we need to be able to adjust is the weights and the biases. So effectively, what we need is to understand the sensitivity of the loss function with respect to the weight. So how, how, do, how much do we know to adjust the weight depending on how it minimizes a loss function? But luckily, because of the nature of uh, how, because of the nature of how the feed forward network is set up, we can estimate the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to any of the weight using the chain rule. So, even though we can't explicitly calculate the partial derivative of the loss with respect to, for this case, just look at weight one, which attaches between X1 and H1. Um, we can decompose that into three easily computable values. The, the, uh, the partial derivative of the loss function with the neural network output, the partial derivative of the neural network output with the activation H1, and the partial derivative of the activation with respect to the weight W1. And how we calculate all of these three uh, decomposed parts are because they're entirely dependent on the weights, the biases, the inputs and the outputs. All values that we know at any instant in learning in the, in, in, in the learning and the propagation of this neural network. So effectively by using this method, we can calculate the partial derivative of the loss with respect to any of these weights and understand how much influence each weight is having on the loss function. So effectively, since we want the loss function to be zero, which means that the neural network output is as close to the true, um, to the ground truth as possible, we want the derivatives to be zero as well. 
So what we would effectively do is update the weights to account for this and minimize the loss function. So since I've only just explained for one of the weights and in a neural network, you would have hundreds of thousands of even up to million weight, millions of weights. It's not much of a, we can easily vectorize all of these weights and do the entire process of back propagation that I've shown in one swift flow by just using matrix computation back uh, in, in a full length. So this is the basic gist of how a neural network is trained, how these weights and biases are uh, trained by effectively using the chain rule. And, and it's, it's not a far-fetched idea. It's, 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 very, it's, 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 it's rooted in fundamental calculus and algebra, but it's just, it requires massive computations to be parallelly done at the same time, which became only extremely possible with the advent of GPUs and GPUs as we've come across, which has put neural networks in quite in the limelight. So since the objective is to build surrogate models to predict how physics field values evolve in time and space so that we can understand how processes grow. I, I'll get into what are the different surrogate model layouts that we look for. One of the most, most popular and prominent physics surrogate model layouts that we find is we feed in the field value at a particular time to across the entire space domain. And we estimate what the field value would be at a later point in time. This has been shown to have considerable uh, speed ups in time uh, up to even, even like, I, there was this paper uh, called Dense, which came out, which predicted uh, scenarios of elms up to about 2 billion times faster than one of the traditional codes. So it's, it's been shown to have much impact, but one of the concerns is that the spatial domain is kind of fixed. We, by, by defining a neural network architecture as the input and the output, we are already fixing what the spatial domain should be, and we don't have much freedom in mixing that about. So in this, the neural net could be a, a convolutional net. You must have heard these terms, a convolutional net, uh, um, a recurrent neural network or a residual network. Or I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of what a neural network would be. Let's just treat it as a black box with N number of layers and M number of neurons. And it doesn't matter what the architecture is for the purpose of understanding this approach. It's that we, it, it, it's just important to understand that we could use any of these sort of structures and architectures to effectively do these. So in these surrogate model layouts, in, in this one, we do from one instant of time to another instant of time, our loss function is just the reconstruction error or the regression error. How much the output of the neural network deviates from the actual ground truth. And the entire network is trained in order to effectively minimize that. The other approach that has been gaining a lot of uh, attraction is instead of putting in the field value as the input, what if we put in the dimensions in the spatial and temporal dimension? Why do, what if we put in the X, Y, Z coordinates or the toroidal coordinates and the time instant in order to predict the field values of interest, which could be density, velocity, vorticity, anything as it might be. So in a simple case, you might put in a one dimensional case, you will put uh, the input as an X value and a T value in order to predict your single field value of interest. We will use the same kind of loss function, measure, uh, minimizing the deviation from the ground truth. Uh, as the reconstruction error in order to, min, uh, to extrapolate and come to the solution. So here, the surrogate models that I've laid out so far, or the gist of the surrogate models, effectively rely a lot on knowing what the ground truth is, Under having a tagged data set, knowing that when this is the X and T values, this is what the output value is going to be. But using such approaches, we are throwing out, we're implicitly depending on the physics to be installed in these tagged data, without explicitly defining any of the known physics modules into it. So that was not appealing because again, we are expecting the network to learn this on its own and it might not do that always. So what if we are aware of some of the physics models and we nudge it to ensure that it al almost always obeys these models. So this led to the evolution of surrogate models with the physics penalty, which, we, which is mostly called as physics informed neural networks or physics guided neural networks, where in addition to the reconstruction error, in addition to minimizing the deviation from the ground truth, we'll also be tr 
trying to ensure that one of the known conservation laws are upheld. So it could be, in this case, I've highlighted the momentum conservation where every time the output from the network actually is in violation of the momentum conservation, an additional penalty is added to the loss function, giving uh, to where your, your, it, it, the weights are adjusted most severely in order to minimize for uh, this sort of error that's being propagated. So we can instill some resemblance of physics models into the model of uh, physics uh, principles into the neural network model using such penalty-based approaches. But still, we do rely quite a bit on um, effectively having matched tagged data in order to, to, to build up these surrogate models. There is another approach, which is what the key area of, this, of focus of this talk will be, that has been gaining quite some traction, uh, which does not depend on data at all. It solves the PDE just knowing the PDE essential factors. So that is the neural PDE, PDEs that uh, we've been exploring quite a lot at Cullum. And um, it's been gaining quite traction in, in all the major tech companies as well. So the neural PDE layout is very similar to the one that I've just shown before. The neural network architecture does not change in any manner from the previous layouts. It, we could effectively use the same neural network architecture in the ones that I've shown before to, to solve the PDE without any data as well. But the loss function that we use to effectively solve the PDE is drastically different. So the loss function is consists of three entities, the three factors that we effectively need to solve a PDE. The initial conditions, which are cap, cap, uh, are uh, utilized in the initial laws. The, the boundary conditions, which are fed in with the, into the boundary loss. And the equation itself, what the derivative dependencies in space and time might be. And that is fixed into the domain laws. So let's just take an arbitrary PDE of the form where F is equal to UT, UT being a partial derivative of U with respect to T, plus lambda of U. Lambda is a function which encapsulates all the spatial derivatives that is of interest to us. X can be multidimensional, belonging to a domain omega, and T is uh, a domain between zero and capital. So we said there are three aspects of our loss function that we need to optimize for in order to solve this. And these three factors come into the initial condition, boundary condition, and the equation itself. So the initial loss, loss is a measure of the neural network output for all values of x within our domain when t is equal to zero, how much it deviates from the initial condition of how or how the initial distribution of the field value u might be. The boundary loss is how much the mod, how much the output of the neural network at the boundary limits deviates from uh, the boundary condition, which could be derelict, Newman, periodic, however it might be. And then the domain loss, which is the function itself. So if we represented the, the, the PDE in, in a form where uh, the, the right-hand side is zero and all the elements are brought to the left-hand side, we effectively calculate as the domain loss, the entirety of the left-hand side. And we minimize that value to each training step in order to ensure that it is as close to zero as possible. The more closer to zero, the more the function is satisfied. So let's, um, I'll, I'll try and bring more clarity with this entire approach with an example. So I'll be using the kotovic debris equation almost all throughout uh, this, this uh, talk mainly because uh, being a highly nonlinear equation with third order dependency actually and, and having, having built solutions for that using this approach kind of shows the robustness of this model and secondly because uh, it, it hel helps build up uh, really pretty graphs and I think that's having a really nice looking graph is always almost always important to convey your point. So consider the equation F, which is um, characterized here within the domain minus one and one. It's a one dimensional equation. We only have to worry about X in this case. And the time domain is between zero and one. We're instilling periodic boundary conditions where we say that 
the field values at the ends as well as its first order derivatives should be the same. So how does a loss function entity sort of change for this? So the initial loss is always measured with in terms of the initial condition. So, so the initial condition is sort of very similar to the reconstruction error, how we calculate it very similar to the reconstruction error because the initial condition is something that we know. It's a distribution of u in space with the time being zero. And all we need to ensure that the, the network follows these initial conditions or is in accordance with these initial conditions is to ensure that the output at t is equal to zero is following the ground truth. So we can effectively use the reconstruction error as uh, the initial loss. So the boundary loss is ensuring that the equations highlighting are met. So since we're looking at a minimizational objective, we'll always bring uh, the equations, the, the, the entities on the right hand side to the left hand side and uh, calculate those values and try to minimize the entire sum of it. And the domain loss is effectively calculated in, in the same manner, very similarly calculated as the boundary loss, but instead of using the boundary conditions, we'll be relying on the function f or this entire theorem. What's key here is in order to calculate the boundary loss and sorry, uh, boundary loss and the domain loss, we need to be able to calculate the partial derivatives of the field as in the output with respect to the inputs. So in order to, we need to calculate the partial derivative of u with respect to t, u with respect to x, and the third order partial derivative of u with respect to x which is hard to pin down explicitly unless we were to use any sort of Newtonian methods. But throwing back to the previous example where I had highlighted the workings of backpropagation, the same method of using the chain rule can be applied to calculate the partial derivatives. So we, since we require the partial derivative of the output with respect to each of the inputs, we can decompose that into parts for which we can effectively calculate. So the partial derivative of y with respect to x1 can be calculated by using the partial derivative of y with respect to h1 and the partial derivative of h1 with respect to x1, which as I mentioned earlier, are easily computable by just knowing the weights, biases, and uh, the input values. So effectively by using back propagation and the chain rule inherently pre present in it, we are able to calculate the local gradients local partial derivatives of the output with respect to any of the inputs within the domain of interest. So we can calculate our uh, dou u by dou x, our dou u by dou t. And these calculated numeric values that we get in can be fed in to the equation here in, in, in the domain loss and the boundary loss to effectively calculate and minimize those values. So to if, to build neural PDs, uh, to solve it for a wide variety of cases, we've been building up this Python package called PD code e that uh, relies on just taking in very few parameters and solve the equation within the parameters that you've given. So the three sets of parameters that is required by the by this particular package is first is your neural PD parameters that defines how the, the neural PD solvable works is just the number of initial points, the number of points that you want to be fed in characterizing the initial loss, the number of boundary points that will characterize the boundary loss and the number of domain points that will characterize the equational loss or the functional loss. So each of these points are um, gathered by a quasi random process. All you define is your lower bound and upper bound and uh, the values of X and T that will be fed in as your initial points, boundary points, and domain points are calculated by, or obtained by doing a quasi random sampling from the, from the established boundaries. So the quasi random sampling, we're looking at a Latin hypercube sampling or Sobol sequence random sampling uh, at this moment to effectively gather. So the idea is the more number of points that we have, the more covered the entire domain would be and more, effectively it will be able to capture more of the essence of the non-linearity and uh, uh, but the more number of points you have the more harder and longer it becomes to train to, to effectively solve so it's kind of a trade-off depending on accuracy and performance that we'll have to 
decide on these little PDE parameters. Then the PDE parameters is the equation itself, which you, you feed in as a string. Uh, the lower and upper bounds of interest, which as, as I mentioned earlier, was minus one to one for X and zero to one for T. The initial condition, uh, the initial distribution of the field values in space and whatever the boundary condition is and if there is a value attached to what that boundary condition might be. And then the neural network parameters that you'd require is how complex do you want the network to be? The number of layers that you want, the number of neurons, how deep, how wide uh, the network that you effectively want. The deeper it is, it sort of is better, which I will get into why, but uh, again, it's a trade-off between performance and accuracy and how good of a surrogate model you want. The effective idea is, to build a surrogate model. It's not about getting the getting to the solution as fast as possible. I mean, getting as getting an accurate solution, entirely accurate solution, but getting very close to the accurate solution as fast as we can, and then working from there. So uh, this is just a layout of it. I, I, I'm guessing this will not be very clear. So I'll just quickly jump to the Jupyter notebook where I've just given set out the layout for this solver. So once you do the necessary inputs, once you pip install it, you don't need to even have to worry about any of the package locations. You outline your neural network parameters. So in the neural network parameters, we have two input neurons. We have the X and the T. So effectively it's the dimension of interest that we give as the input neuron. How many field values are we calculating? We only have U over here. So it's only one to worry about. And the number of layers and the number of neurons that we want for each of those. So then we have uh, the neural PDE parameters. So what sort of sampling method would you want to use? What, what, what sort of random quasi random approaches would you want to take in order to gather these points? The X and T values that will be fed to calculate the initial loss, the boundary loss, and the domain loss. And the number of points that you would want to get, gather from each of these. So the, and the PDE parameters are the equation where um, underscore represents a partial derivative between uh, the previous value to the other value, to, 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 to the preceding value, to the following value, sorry. Um, and the order of the equation, how many, how, which, which order do you want the model to calculate the local gradients, the local derivatives of interest? Since we have a third order differential equation, uh, we put in the order this three. And then the upper and lower bounds for it. So minus one is uh, for x, plus one is the upper bound for X and the same for its time value. So if we have, if we were to have Y, it would be an additional value of minus one to one or whatever the range it might be. The boundary conditions of interest. So far the package effectively will support uh, derelict human and periodic boundary conditions and we're constantly looking to expand and uh, include more. Uh, and then the boundary value. Since it's periodic, we don't have to specify any boundary value. We can leave it as none. But if it was derelict then we had a specific value or a uh, we would put that there. The initial condition, I'm starting off with a cosinal initial condition for the distribution of U and just have to feed the effective values in. Uh, once this is just obtaining the trade or the, 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 the testing data and the training data, which is sampled from our sampler that I mentioned earlier and all the parameters are stored uh, at a different file. Once we have the parameters and the training data that we require, we instantiate the graph of the network and we create the model. Uh, the model needs to be trained now. Once we have all this layout and the graph, everything is instantiated, we need to train, which is to effectively arrive at the solution. We have to start calling in the optimizer for this. So the package supports two kinds of optimizers, three actually. Uh, but of two natures. One is anything that relies on a stochastic gradient descent model, which will be characterized as GD. Uh, so it could be Adam, Adadelta, any of your cutting edge uh, you know, optimizers that has been supported by TensorFlow. So another thing that I forgot to mention, currently there is only support for TensorFlow for this model, for this package. Uh, we, are look, we are currently expanding that to include more PyTorch support as well. And in the next iteration of it, we hope to have an implementation of PyTorch for it. But right now, it's only TensorFlow. So the optimizer will have, uh, will depend, will be able to take in any of the optimizers available in the TensorFlow uh, library. Uh, the learning rate attached to it. So how quickly do you want to get to the solution? How much do you want to change each weight, each over each iteration? How minuscule do you want the training process to be? Do you, I, you characterize that by the learning rate? And then the number of iterations that you want 
to want the model to be trained through using a stochastic gradient descent model. And then you effectively put that for training and uh, the model is brought into its own. The other approach is the quasi-Newtonian approaches. So LZ Harbour had a beautiful paper published in 2006 that actually talks about the optimization for speeding constraints. And uh, he mentions the requirement that the paper quite, quite beautifully outlines why we require more uh, Newtonian approaches are very inherent to solving PDs and 4D structures. So what we effectively have found in this sort of packages is that we get better solution results if we use a gradient descent to start off with. So get very quickly to a good approximation of the solution using a gradient descent model. And then it's fine-tuned using a quasi-Newtonian solver. So here I've used the LBFGSP. Um, optimizer for that and uh, the quasi-Newtonian solvers so with the latest updation from TensorFlow TF1x to TF2x since they have left away the contra module we have had to sort of work around and add wrappers to ensure that quasi-Newtonian support can come from the SciPy package as well as uh, from the TensorFlow probability package though the SciPy package clearly does outperform the TensorFlow probability package and is mostly sought out so in terms of dependencies for using this Python package, it's mostly um, TensorFlow, SciPy, and NumPy. It, the, the, to, to, in order to run this, this neural PDA solver, all we need is these three effective libraries as well. And it's, it only has support for TensorFlow 2.0, and we just wanted to keep it modern and go ahead with the libraries as it's being developed. So to, back to the slides. Uh, so how would a solution that comes from this sort of approach look like? So this is a small video. Uh, ignore the, le le the legend. It will fix itself once the video starts. It's just the first frame is a bit sketchy and I didn't have time to fix that. So here the neural network output is in the pink and the actual output is in the purple. And neural network output is imposed on top of the actual output. And we can see how the time evolution of the equation might be. This is modeled and solved without using any data, any knowledge of how the U value should be at any point in time and space. So we, we don't re really require any simulation data, any experimental data in order to clearly use this approach. So taking a closer look at our solution, we, sorry, we can see that the actual dynamics and the learned dynamics have a considerably good plot. This is, um, uh, contour plot that's taken over the entirety of, uh, of space-time that we're interested in modeling. And there is considerably good agreement with how the physics needs to evolve in space and time using the neural PDE solver in comparison to a traditional spectral solver that we have used to generate data. So this graph on the bottom effectively shows the unlearned dynamics. So it's a mean absolute error between these two plots. and it's quite funny how uh, an equation that is used to model uh, wave formation in shallow waters is, is giving us this level of unlearned dynamics because it's, it's, it effectively looks like the solution itself. So there is some periodicity within the solution which warrants further inquiry into that. But it's well within the margin of error for us as far as the surrogate model is concerned for us to actually trust and work ahead with this approach. So, uh, in terms of uh, on, on, on understanding how well or how good this sort of approach can effectively approximate the solution because that is what a neural network does best is to effectively approximate the solution at a fraction of the cost. So there are three kinds of errors that come in while we apply a neural PD solver. One is uh, the approximation error. So by defining an architecture, by defining a set of weights and biases, we're effectively limiting the expanse of the function space. There is a considerable limit to how well a network can perform that's given by its architecture. So the best function that can be as close to the original solution in the function space F. So this assumes that our uh, entire network is at a global minimum of solving that particular point. The other is the generalization error. So it's given down by the number of points. So if we don't have 
it's if 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 it's if it's not very densely located from the domain area of of, of space and time we might be missing out nonlinear patches of behavior in different regions and that might not be able to uh, the neural network might not be able to learn that so it could not it 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 it, it, it tends to become more specific in, in certain areas and fails to generalize in different uh, approaches so the the third is the optimization error this is uh, one of the biggest nightmares of anyone who trains neural networks it's getting stuck in um, uh, a local minimum because the larger the network the more weights the more local minima we have the more uh, uh, we tend to deviate away from our global minima and that effectively is is a problem that we could come across so how do we determine on the architecture is there is no effective science for it it's more about intuition and, and practice and uh, uh, what we think might be necessary because it's like i mentioned it's always a trade off between performance and accuracy the more complex that we have uh, the more longer it might take to train the more more points it might require uh, but it might end up being more accurate so how much how good of a solution are we looking for and that determines how, what impact each of these errors will have on to our final solution but still if we were to compare with our numerical or traditional solvers there are considerable advantages that a numerical unit can bring about one is that the traditional solvers have higher high round off and truncation errors and approximation errors that come from uh, uh, effectively using uh, in 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 the tailored approximations that we'll have to choose while we're solving the equation uh, the other is the curse of dimensionality the, uh, the more dimensions we increase the more grids most the size of the grid increases the more complex it effectively becomes to solve a numeric uh, to solve a pd using a numerical approach and that is related to how it's confined to a mesh we do, while we're using a traditional numerical solver we are entirely dependent are we solving the field value for a particular point in space time it's it's confined to a particular mesh that we create and it's it's it, it comes from the discretization that comes with this sort of approach but in a neural pde since we are not discretizing it at all we're only limiting our input space to an upper bound and a lower bound it's not confined to a mesh and it can effectively solve and build solutions for the entirety of that space and the last is pretty much a strong suit is uh, how neural pde solvers can be vastly accelerated on gpus and and even more so on tpus and how well these modern uh, machine learning libraries such as tensorflow and pytorch are uh, built to handle such level of parallel processing it tends to actually give a lot of insight into the sort of model but this isn't the model that i've just shown you is an extremely cheap to run yet we are looking to optimize and and make it extremely faster so right now it took approximately 2 hours on a single cpu which is not is is not what this was built for but accelerated to a single gpu it is able to converge within 10 minutes uh the other problem is that each time we have to solve for a pd we are retraining a network we're training a network from scratch so we're initializing instantiating a network and training it from scratch and we are kind of throwing away a lot of learned general dynamics in this sort of case specific approach so there's been a lot of inquiry into how can we build more case agnostic models and we have our own set of research that we've been carrying forward with that but i wanted to share something which came out a couple of years ago which was one of the first more approaches in in building these case agnostic models and um, and one uh, just like the highlight of how that would even work so this is what came out by uh, mazia raizi who is then at brown university the professor at brown university came up with this sort of deep hidden hidden physics model of 2 years ago where uh, by using the same approach for a neural pd solver can we effectively understand the gradient mapping the dependency between the different partial derivatives to the in, to, to to the input and use that and and keep a network trained for that and use that each time we're solving for a new solution so this sort of model has uh, uh, two dif two different neural networks that we initially have to train one is the identifier which relies on a perfectly labeled solution data set and the other is a lambda function uh, a lambda network sorry 
uh, which effectively trains the sort of latent gradient map. So the identifier is just a simple neural network which takes an X and T, maps to you, and is trained using the reconstruction. We know what the ground truth will be for one particular case, and or one or many particular cases, and we train this network in order to map to that level of ground truth. Once we have the identifier trained, we will effectively train the lambda network where we use the output from the identifier, take, trace the output from, from the identifier back to UX and UT and its higher order derivatives and use the spatial, partial spatial derivatives as the input to the lambda network to map to the time derivative. And the objective of the lambda network is to minimize this loss function. So it then effectively balance the, uh, the entire PD without getting into the specific diffusion coefficient or any other sort of factors that um, make it more case specific. So you effectively train this lambda network and this lambda network is used to, to, to in, 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 at, in, in tandem with an other solver network to effectively come to the solution. So a solver network is very similar to the identifier network that we used. It starts from scratch. You feed in your X and T values. You don't know what the U value or the output might be. But if you feed in the X and T value, you obtain the U value. Using the solver network, solution network itself, we trace back the partial derivatives between U and X and U and T, and we feed that to the lambda function. So the loss function effectively involves ensuring the reconstruction error of the initial conditions are met, the boundary conditions are met, and this is in tandem. So the spatial order, higher order of derivatives are in tandem with uh, the temporal derivatives as Lambda had uh, learned from the, uh, uh, from the identifier network. So it's, this sort of approach is, isn't a solution as a be all end all. This has its claims where we're not throwing away our physics models that we've learned yet. We are, effectively reusing some of these sort of gradient mappings to help us build surrogate models a bit more faster. So one of the concerns that I mentioned was it took about 10 minutes to run and solve uh, to get to the solution for the other end. But in using this sort of approach, the solution network can be trained in uh, roughly five, three to five minutes. And that is a considerable speed up. But we, 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 I, like I'll show you right now, we have, actually have some variations in accuracy that comes with. So in this, the identifier is both, both, I'm still solving the quadratic degree equation. The identifier is a sinusoidal curve while the solution is a cosine curve. The periodic boundary conditions are established and maintained for both of uh, these cases that I'm looking at. So once we train the identifier, which is only dependent on the reconstruction error and not effectively using any gradient mapping, not uh, solving for the PDE itself, it, as we expect, it gives a considerably great fit as uh, because it's just mapping to because we know what the ground truth should be and it's not dependent on the physics and we can map exactly to what the ground truth needs to be. The solution on the other hand actually varies a little bit from the ground truth again because we've depended on the gradient mappings from another solution and it it how much of importance should we attribute to that is actually a question. It, it does give us a solution within about less than half of the time that was required in another case, but we do notice that there are certain deviations from the actual um, uh, ground truth. But taking a closer look at the dynamics, we see that it's, it's quite within like a model of error for a surrogate model and it's something that we can still definitely proceed with, but with caution. So just to how, how just to quickly wrap up and outline the additional functionalities that the Python package that we've been the PDE query that we've been building has is one is that it has better sampling strategies where it will isolate and identify regions in 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 our space time domain where the nonlinearity is not being effectively captured and and train harder and train more harder and deeper at those extents to effectively capture a model those 
then in order to have considerable more speed up, so we've been looking at higher order approximation in terms of like deep Gallican methods. I'll uh, link you to the paper and the material that actually represents this. We're capable of utilizing more complex network elements like batch normalization, sparse net, residual neural networks, again, convolutions, and all of that into the model itself. And we've been experimenting with a lot of approaches for this sort of case agnostic modeling. How can we represent and learn more of the latent behaviors of the equation without solving the equation itself, which can be used again and again to solve uh, the equation. Uh, so just to briefly summarize this, is all of these approaches that I've outlined here, whether it's to start from just the reconstruction error, just training to fit the data, or training to fit the data with a physics penalty, or just using the physics to solve the equation. It depends on how good a surrogate model you want and how, what the purpose of building this. If there, is, there are trade-offs with each of these approaches. And um, it's very important to understand what level of accuracy that we require for the solution, how, what impact your solution is having on the greater grander scheme of things and choosing each of this. So it's, it's, um, it's understanding the best fit for your use case and rather than just using something out of the box and uh, building a surrogate model. So it, 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 it focuses a lot on understanding what this sort of surrogate model might require. So uh, I'm just ending it with giving you the references on the vast work that has been done on this approach uh, of neural PD solvers in the past two years. It's, it's a very cutting edge field uh, only for the fact that uh, Neural networks, machine learning has become accessible and GPUs and GPUs have become accessible only in the past couple of years. And that has led to quite an explosion in this field, as you can see, with most of these papers are from the past two, three years. And these are one of the papers at the forefront of it built by, some of it by NVIDIA, DeepMind, um, Google, and some major universities across the world as well. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you been able to grasp that all have been spewing out for the past 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vignesh, uh, for the nice talk. Uh, I'm pretty sure one thing is definitely clear to everyone now that you are working at CCFE while you are designing or you are helping in designing physics-based uh, surrogate models where they can capture some physics of the tokama and use it in maybe a real time uh, simulation or anything like that. Anyway, we now open the session for questions and answers. If uh, you have any questions, please raise your hands and I will uh, unmute you in the order so that you can have your question asked. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks for like amazing talk. Oh, thank you. Th that was good. Um, one rather, I guess, like I don't have sufficient background, but you mentioned that for uh, highly dimensional problems, this uh, might be beneficial in terms of computational resources. Um, just curious, have you done the comparison in terms of computational resources for the one dimensional problem that you've been solving in particular between the, like, have you tried numerical, like, just your basic numerical PD solver, you're getting your analytical solutions from somewhere, right? Right, right. Versus the... Yeah. Uh, there is considerable that well the analytical solution that I built for or uh, sorry the numerical solution that I actually built using a spectral solver for the KDB equation took about three minutes on a CPU which is not to say that it actually does a speed up but if we were to look at higher dimensions the effective calculation in the gradients for the PD uh, the neural PD solver is it's not going up by a squared factor like how it would in a traditional mesh based solver it's only just multiplied by an additional value do you get that 
Yeah, I have like yeah. So in a one dimensional idea. case, in a one dimensional case, because the domain, the discretization of the domain and the mesh, it, so there is not really a mesh, but the discretization of the line is not uh, it's very severe. It does not reflect on this approach. Yeah. So it maybe I guess like as a suggestion, I guess it's no, no, no. Really... So yeah, it's it's we've been we're experimenting on two dimensional models where uh, it it's uh, thrown up on GPUs, it still performs. But again, the key is the neural network training, since we're looking at millions of parameters at, at most, it only works if we were to use GPUs. It's just using GPUs for training these models, unlike traditional solvers, does not require a lot of augmentation. So it's never going to substantiate a numerical solver in your traditional CPU approaches. Mainly because how the the, the matrix the, the vectorization requires this level of parallelized uh, computation to outshine the numerical solvers. Okay, yeah, that's I guess kind of clearly clearly stated right from the start. That yeah, yeah. The, you'll never. It, it, it's not that it's a replacement in any regard. It's uh, as a PD solver, which can be sort of deployed sort of as quite off the rack onto a GPU, it has its a, has a lot to offer. Yeah, I guess like maybe a suggestion, have you ever, have you tried like doing some somewhat of a, you know, scalability chart, like how your, how your neural network based solution grows in terms of computational resources with like with increasing in the mesh, like how, how sparse or dense so dimensions well, or how with dump dimensions so that to make it more, do you see what I'm saying? I, I, I understand. I, I haven't done that, but one of the papers that I've actually given away or the deep XD one, this one actually does their sense of complexity analysis. And in that they do actually show um, how that grows. And so if I, if I remember the mesh based sort of will be is, is if it's a third order third dimensional equation, it will be n to the power Q, uh, complexity, but in this, it would be D into N, N being the number of points that we, that we actually call and D being the dimensions that we actually install. Okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't, <laughs> I have I not, I, 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 I can only reference just... to... sorry. I wasn't aiming for such a detailed answer. I was just kind of... <laughs> no, so that, that, uh, the thing is, I haven't, uh, since it's been only like a month since we've built this, actually since the lockdown started, uh, plenty of time on my hands. Um, so uh, we haven't done an in-depth analysis on in terms of complexity. We've been actually just building prototype working models and seeing it works. Oh, okay. Complex. Just but, enjoying the fact yeah, of it. Uh, this, is, uh, I, I, this is the analysis that I've, come across the only one I can actually refer to you uh, to these to, to this list and then uh, you can come across the other uh, the, the calculation they've done we, we plan to effectively once we optimize the code for more faster delivery we want to okay thanks good one. anyone else with some questions yeah hello uh, uh, very, very exciting stuff. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, this is like very new, edgy um, approach to solving problems. And then I've seen now in references some um, already application on Tatamax. So I was interested like, um, yeah, so it already found some application. What is it and what is it? What is an output in that regard? Oh, are you asking like in, in, in terms of like fusion modeling where yeah. sort of approach lies? Yeah. So far it's, uh, as a neural network based surrogate modeling, dependent on data, it's being used quite, uh, quite prominently. And one of the two main papers are, uh, the mesh free flow net that I've outlined at the bottom and a very selfish plug is one of our papers that we used it to, uh, calculate how the edge characteristics, uh, the, it will evolve using neural networks. And uh, um, there was another paper called Dense, which I think I mentioned initially. Don't know if uh -huh. I mentioned it over here. But uh, neural PDE solvers are still very 
is a very relatively new and people have a lot have, there's a lot to be proven especially like one of the raised questions that was raised by the previous person was how well does it scale and it, it definitely needs to be scaled comparatively to like three dimensional solvers uh, for it to actually have impact so neural pd solvers i can't argue for anywhere else in the world, but in Kalum, we are really experimenting with it. That's why the examples are very short, they're very limited. We're building this package to, for a lot of people to use it in multiple scenarios uh, and give us feedback so we can uh, work on, on and improve mm -hmm. upon it. But so far, there's not been a paper or a model where which we've invoked this. But traditional neural network surrogate models that actually depend on just Reconstruction error and fitting as best to the data as possible is actually being used quite widely. Yeah. It's not just for uh, in surrogate modeling and simulation data, but uh, in analyzing uh, volumetric or any other diagnostic data, as well as streamlining uh, workflows. So right now with the UK building step, there's a lot of questions up in the air, especially in terms of the geometry and, and the kind of materials that we require and what would that mean for the TBR value. Of the tritium breeding ratio and we were looking at building surrogate neural network based models which actually perform quite amazingly well considering that they have to be compared with bayesian approaches and uh, very well within the margins of error of interest which streamlines the workflow and gets data to the data and simulation to the engineers as quick as possible so there is a lot of work but neural pds still have a lot more catch up and actually it has to prove its metal quite a lot it, it still isn't robust yet to deploy in, in any of those regards Hopefully, we'll see a lot more excitement in the next couple, couple, couple of years. Do you have any output where could it be like easily, I mean, the easiest or at least difficult applied first? Uh, for, uh, you mean using a neural PD? Actually, no. uh, I don't know if you're aware, there is this code called JORIC. Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we've actually been trying to use this for uh, JORIC based, I mean, benchmarking it against JORIC for Elm. Uh, uh, modeling. So that is, if, if, if this approach actually shows some chance infusion, I think that'll be one of the first areas. We still haven't got a working prototype yet, uh, mainly because halfway through building the model, we had to go from TensorFlow 1 to 2, and that was kind of a mess. But that will be one of the first areas that we'll be touching, I guess, because this is specific focus on data analysis and, and, and analyzing elements at this point. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia, if I am pronouncing your name correctly. We have another question from Kimura. Um, again, I'm not sure if I'm uh, pronouncing your name correctly, but here I go to unmute you. We, we cannot hear you, sorry. Um, how about now? Uh, slightly oh. better. Okay, yeah, I have a bit problems with my microphone. Um, but can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite all right. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks for the talk. And uh, my question is, um, well, I recall that you mentioned that you implemented spectral analysis in your uh, neural network. I kind of lost you. I'm sorry, I kind of lost you there for a bit. I with anything before neural networks, I didn't hear. Uh, yeah. So, um, you said that you use a stochastic analysis for your neural network. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about uh, that, like Did which you analysis you use. Stochastic analysis? Yeah. Um, I don't think I've used, I, I, I mean, I don't think I explicitly used the word stochastic analysis in the modeling. The, area where I might have used it is in terms of how the input uh, values of the dimensions of the coordinates were sampled. Right. Is that, 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 that probably because at, at this point, this model can't, uh, are not very built to solve stochastic differential equations. Oh, okay. If that was the question. It's not, and right now, I mean, no, there are neural PD based approaches in stochastic differential equation solving. It's just that our package currently does not have the capability for it. There's been proof of concepts built. There's been a couple of papers published in this regard, but we are uh, we haven't incorporated that into the models yet. Those will be additional modules that we hope to and want to build, but not right now. But the only time that I must have used stochastic or must have been in the sampling. So 
it's 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 just we want an effectively uniform sampling problem within the domain space that we are creating but that is the initial approach and once we have a uniform sampling the nonlinearities of how the output behaves is not very uniform in terms of, of the input some areas it's it's quite static or the gradient changes in the field values or the dependencies to its coordinates might not be it might not be very steep in some areas it might be extremely steep so if we were to give it a uniform balanced out uh, distribution in how we sample it we are not giving enough weightage to where the nonlinearity is especially strong so we have the spatial temporal like residual loss based uh, sampler which will isolate areas in the hyper uh, in the input feature space where we need more points because it's more it's it's it it needs to be trained a bit more deeper in 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 uh, with those points to effectively model the physics so that is something that we've been looking at but uh, apart from that uh, there's not much for element of stochasticity it's a very deterministic model it's not giving you a distributional output it's a point distributional output it's not uh, the gradients are very local point localized grade uh, distribution uh, values that we're calculating it's to that particular point within machine machine precision effectively uh, and um, it's it's got no element of a bayesian neural network if that sort of is the question at this point but we'll hopefully want to add all of that again those are all trade offs in terms of do we want a distribution or do we want a deterministic value that's good enough to work because again having a stochastic approach will make it a bit more uh, longer to converge and so on thank you Okay, uh, I hope that answers your question. So while we wait for one last question before closing the session, I would like to remind you all that we have posted some links. One is the survey link where we would invite you to tell us about your experience with the talk, where we can improve, where you liked that we did good. There is also a link to subscribe to our email list to receive the summary, Zoom link and password for our future webinars. And also, if you or your friends just missed out on talk, join late, or any other reasons, we have a YouTube channel where we will upload the video once we process it, and it will be available uh, for anyone to access. Um, with that, I'll call for one last time if there is any other question. I see no hands being raised. So with that, I would like to thank you, Vignesh, for the great talk. And thank you all uh, very much for joining us. I hope uh, we succeeded in uh, providing you with something new. Um, yeah, sorry, just a question. We have a question from Jerome Hag, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Sorry, sir. Uh, he wishes uh, if he can have an email for contact. I think oh, that means uh, for Vignesh. Absolutely, yeah. fantastic. And and by the way, uh, I think I don't know if I clearly mentioned this, but the package that we built is kind of in beta, as you can see. It's a uh, way of figuring out bugs, and mainly because like building a package other than doing uh, research-based programming to actually building an industry-level package has been kind of a big transition. So it's still in a little bit beta phase. So we haven't. A, Loaded it to PIP yet because there's documentation and adaptation to PyTorch pending. Once all of that is there, it will be PIP installed. But if anybody wants to play around with the package, I'm more than happy to like send the file because it's not it's obviously not very big. Uh, so yeah, feel free to reach out to me. I how do you want? Do I actually need to attach my email at the chat or? Yeah, that would be that would be great if you could do that so that. Uh... Yeah, I'll just hold on. Okay, got it. Yeah, I'll just attach the email right away. Uh, yeah, you'll have to write it, Vignesh. I think yeah, I got it. it. I, think, I, I just did it. Okay. Is, is, can okay. I be able to do that? Is that all right? Yeah, it's in the all chat. Yeah, it's effectively my name, uh, first name dot surname at uka dot uk. So it should be relatively easy. Great. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot, Vignesh. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, great evening. 
or, or night, depending on the time zone. And we hope to see you on our next talks. Cheerio.